before I start, I want to just, if you joined for a particular reason, you had a particular question, if anyone wants to let me know like why you joined this talk to make sure I hit that point. Um, what are you hoping to see or what did you think this is? Be helpful if anyone has anything. Or if it's totally exploratory, we can just start from the top. Yeah, uh, we, we work with a lot of clients and users who are much more familiar with spreadsheets and sometimes need to transfer data back and forth, so interested in tools that let us do that. Perfect. Okay, that's exactly what this is, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so I'm Anais. I'm co-CEO at Grist. It's a startup. We're building a modern open source spreadsheet that users can trust. So we've been talking a lot about open data, but what about the actual tools you use to work with that data? We want it to have the values that we have, but also be of good quality. And why a spreadsheet? What, what's your name? Zane. So Zane was talking about clients that are comfortable with spreadsheets. Um, and there's a reason why people like spreadsheets. Uh, we've been loving spreadsheets for a long time. <laughs> so this is uh, 1800 BC, Babylonian clay tablet, numbers in cuneiform. Um, there's something about the grid that makes it possible to organize just about any kind of data. And if you think about it, spreadsheets are the OG business app. You could build a CRM, a project tracker, you can do accounting, uh, project management, you can do all kinds of things in a spreadsheet. Uh, and it also puts the user in control of business logic. Spreadsheet formulas are a low-code programming language that a lot of people use. And a spreadsheet is self-contained. When you send somebody a spreadsheet file, it has the data and the business logic contained in that file. And then if they have a way to open it, they can interact with it. But the, inter the internet has changed the way that we work. Your spreadsheet or app has to be collaborative. You need to have mobile access. You're collecting data from others. And this is where things can get thorny very quickly. And you need an API to push and pull data. And spreadsheets have tried to keep up. But, oh, it's gone. Trust me, they've tried to keep up. <laughs> I'll keep going because it's logos you're familiar with. The more classic spreadsheets like um, uh, uh, Google Sheets or Excel, uh, they're spreadsheets. They have all of the benefits that I just mentioned, but some of the drawbacks are the data is not structured, which means if you're connecting it to other tools, somebody goes in there, changes the structure, and the whole thing falls apart. The data is not relational, though I've seen people spend weeks or months trying to make it relational, very impressive. And I don't tell those people about Gris because it's like telling somebody who stubbed their toe and is pretending it doesn't hurt that you know it hurts. So I'm just like, sure, you're very cool. So <laughs> they make it relational, but then the data organization is not very robust. And also the collaborative part, your um, user access controls are very blunt. So you could hide a sheet, you could password protect some cells, but what people end up doing, it's lower, uh, people with, who have le uh, less privilege, they get copies of a piece of the data to fill in and then send to somebody, probably a woman in some department who's consolidating it every single month. And if she's out of office, no one knows what the data is. And then you also have um, the spreadsheet database hybrids like Airtable and Monday. Many in many cases, they're just not spreadsheet enough. They don't have the spreadsheet shortcuts that you're used to. They may not feel enough like a spreadsheet, so it could be a barrier for some people to adopt them. And also, my pet peeve, they don't handle undo redo very well. Uh, also, they're very limited in their formula support. So in terms of the business logic, data analysis, and processing, it's very limited on that and on those kinds of tools. And also, if it's in the cloud, your data's locked in. So if you want to get something out of Airtable, you're taking every table out as a CSV. You can't just take your whole database, which means you can't share your solutions with others very easily. And do you really feel like you own your database that you built? So here's what we're doing. We're going to start with the values. So Grist is open source, respects user privacy, secure, can run everywhere. So we have our SaaS, but you can host it on your own servers. There's a desktop version as well. And the data is very portable in popular formats. So you can export it in CSVs and Excels or as a .gris, which is based on a SQLite. So what you're building in Grist, even though it feels like a spreadsheet, is a SQLite database. And what I have in this box over here, it's um, so our biggest customer and partners right now, it's actually the French government. They're building something called La Suite Numerique, which is fun to say. <laughs> and 
Uh, they have a mandate to move away from closed uh, source proprietary software, and they're building a whole suite that they're calling their sovereign suite. First, there's one tool there. So for example, they use TChap instead of Slack because it's open source. Outline instead of like Notion or Microsoft Word. And then Grist is their replacement for um, like Excel and Access and that kind of stuff. And then this picture was from VivaTech. It's like the CES of Europe. Happened last week. The guy who runs it talked about it and uh, it was very cute. He said Grist is the crown jewel. We're like, ooh, so <laughs> yeah. And on the tech side, like I said, you start with a simple spreadsheet. We abstract the relational data part of it for you, so you don't need to know what a foreign key is in order to start building a relational database. And then there's the data app component, where you can link different views, and I'm gonna show you, but you can link different views in um, a workflow that makes sense to you, because you're the domain expert in how this should work, but the data is still structured in a SQL-like database um, that can connect to other tools or be exported or shared. And this stops people from doing things like merging a bunch of cells. You can't in Grist because <laughs> it's not a good idea. But that's what people are doing in Excel when they're merging cells and adding colors. They're trying to make a visual dashboard. OK, cool story. Is it any good? Oh, that was disconnected from the internet. Reconnect. OK, so here we have the simplest thing. This is Grist, and actually this is, is the text really small? Should I zoom in? Okay, so this should just look like a spreadsheet. So I just imported two CSVs. Um, for this example, we are a nonprofit. We're working with people in legal, housing, or uh, food insecurity crisis. We have a table of clients, and instead of the ribbon on the top like in Excel, we just kind of have it on the side here. And you can see like in a database, the fields have a particular type, so this is a uh, date column, or we can have text, or we can have um, choices that you select from uh, pre-filled values, so that just to keep data clean for uh, values that are repeated. So here's all of our clients, and we also have intake information. When a client um, comes to the office, we take information at that point about their need. So a client um, could come more than once. So in row three, we have Aisha, and she's also in row 13. So we should relate each intake to a particular client. That's just a different column type. So instead of date or text or choice, it's a reference. In this case, Grist is already making a guess because it sees there's values in another table, so it's just a little magic for us. So I'm gonna apply that, which means now when I come in here, I can select from existing clients or I can start typing a new one. But if I were to add a new one, and then need to add client information, and I don't want to go to a different page to do that. So before I do that, let's get to the dashboard building. So let's say I want to see, when I click on an intake, I want to see that client as a card that's easy to fill in and edit. So I'm just going to go ahead, add to this existing page, as a card, the clients, and it's letting me select because of that reference. So Gris knows there's a relationship between these two tables. So now, as I click through the rows, it'll start updating with that client information. And I can drag and drop and make this look nicer and just make it more friendly. But the key thing is even as I'm using views, the underlying structure remains the same. So if I add a new thing here for Aisha, I can see her existing information. Also, you might have noticed this automatically filled in. There's something called trigger formulas. It's like a regular formula, except it only updates on either when a record's created or updated, and then it's stored as data. So it's good for like, if you want to put like a unique identifier on something, have it generate and then not recalculate on reload. So I could edit Aisha's email here. Or maybe somebody new came. So I'm adding this new person. And I can edit here, and they were born today. Happy birthday. And the cool thing is, if I were to look at the client's table from any view, but we'll just go to the one that's already convenient, I can see this new one was added, and I can see the update to the Aisha record that I made from a different dashboard. So people are working in something that feels like an app, but the data remains clean and structured. And this is the very heart of what Grist is. It's way more extendable from there. Um, so let me show you what if this was built out a little bit more.
So here, same use case, we have intake. I can go through, see the clients on the right, see the intake information here, or maybe instead I want to do it the other way. I want to click on a client and see all of their intake records. There's some conditional formatting when a row lights up if something is urgent. I might have some charts. Um, so this is telling me the breakdown between food crisis, housing or legal crisis, uh, also over time. And this will just automatically update. You don't need to go and change the range like you would in Excel. As you add data, this will just update. Maybe I'm also tracking um, different team members. These are people who work at the nonprofit. They have different specializations at different offices. And GRIS is extendable because you can add custom widgets, which means if I don't want something as a chart, a table, or a card, maybe I want to see something in a map. So here I have this map. It's interactive. It's actually linked to my table. So you can, um, let me actually move around so you can see what I mean. Oh, I think I added another row in it was looking for it. Okay, so if I just kind of move around, I want it to scroll, that's what I want. Okay, and it's showing me who's at this office. And the reason I want to show you this office part of it is the, um, the really cool thing is the granular access rules, which is, so let's go back to team members. Berenice is in Puebla, and in the intakes, I only want her to see Puebla. I don't want her to see Mexico City, I don't want her to see Pachuca, I only want to see Puebla. Um, but I don't want to make another copy for that. I just want the data to get filtered for her automatically as people are working on this. So I already set up access rules. I can view as her, as the owner, to see if things are working correctly. And we can see that only Puebla show it up. And it just gets filtered. And it's at the data level, not the view level. So it's not like you can go to another view and see it. So I'm going to go back to viewing as myself, just real quick for the curious. Access rules are written in a simplified version of Python. So basically this is saying if the team member's office matches the office in the intake record, show it, otherwise hide it. And it can get very granular, read access, write access, and things like that as well. Okay, so the quick techie rundown. <laughs> so just a little bit more about what's possible. Uh, formulas can be written in Python, supports the full Python syntax, the whole standard library. It also has many Excel functions. It's just Python, but we wrote it for you to make your life easier, <laughs> and you can call an Excel function. Um, like I mentioned, it's a self-contained format based on SQLite. It integrates with a REST API. We have a REST API, also like N8N or similar integrators like Zapier or Make are supported. Custom views include like the map. People have gotten really creative with that. Um, Sometimes people use custom widgets not even for a view, but to sort of execute on workflows. Like somebody built one where with, when they push a button, it automatically backs something up externally in um, as a SQLite file, an Excel, and a CSV. Um, oh, the granular access controls, that was the Berenice thing. Those can get uh, very granular down to the row, column, or table. First has many flavors. I mentioned the desktop version. There's also a CSV viewer most people don't know about. So, uh, basically, it lets you preview a CSV file that's published on a static web page without a backend, the way you can preview a PDF. So then the filtering and all of that works. And the documentation's open source. We do maintain it, but we'll take you know, any fixes. And all the translations have been open source, all volunteers. It's in 22 languages right now. Yeah, Slovak got added as I was flying here. So, <laughs> okay. Um, this data dance party, I just want to show you, um, it's a little silly, but so a community contributor, he doesn't work for us, he's a developer, he's very good, he just wanted to have fun in Grist. So he did this thing, but it just kind of tells you like how extendable it is with custom widgets. Oh, that's way too loud. I did want the music, but not that loud. Okay. The point is, what he did is he embedded a music player. That's not doing anything. It's just reading something. But then he has this where he's using something called PaySage to basically visualize red, green, and blue and create bubbles. He just did this for fun and also to play with what you can do with Grist if you really want to extend it. I'll just kind of jump ahead. Yeah, it's just fun. So this is the data dance party. Okay. 
Okay, and then um, the very last thing, so that's good timing, we're here. <laughs> so, um, oh, and this, this QR code, this is just a little Easter egg. We uh, take April Fools too seriously. So um, there's been talk in the past about how like CSV, it's widely accepted, widely used because a lot of applications will use it, but it has some drawbacks and there's been arguments out there that uh, instead of using commas to separate it, using like the poo emoji would be funnier and actually better for technical reasons. This QR code takes you to um, a blog post that we wrote when we made this, like this works in Grist. You can import and export do separated values. So we took this idea that people, have been, we didn't come up with the idea, but we implemented it um, because, you know, it was April 1st. So <laughs> we had to. Um, yeah, and then here's a QR code if you want to request more info, um, which is a form, it has native forms as well, um, or I can give you a business card. Uh, any questions? Yeah, thanks. I'm curious, to what scale of data it works well and whether it's possible to bring an existing SQLite database in to the interface? That's a great question. It's really for spreadsheet size data, so we're talking the hundred thousands of rows. Um, really, it's because of the data engine. Makes it, it's more of a technical challenge. Uh, people kind of push the limits all the time, especially on their own infrastructure. Um, the actual data limit really depends on your data, your data size. You can add attachments. You can, if your formulas are really intense, that's going to slow things down. Or if you have, you know, way too many columns. Um, so yeah, really for hundred, you can't attach an existing SQL light. But what users have been doing, it's for example. Um, one is an insure tech company. They already have a Postgres database that has a bunch of like pricing information and they need pieces of that to go to an interface that their actuaries can use to work with that data, make updates, and then send it back to the database. They use Grist for that, right? Or some kind of like data indexing or cataloging. Um, another one, they're bringing in daily data for like, it's coming from social media accounts. They're doing it, um, They'll keep the daily for like a month, then they prune it to monthly and they just keep the aggregates, for example. So people get creative. And that is on our roadmap to figure out large data here. How can we make it work with the data engine? But yeah, it's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So it works on spreadsheet scale. Yeah. You know, so, and you mentioned there are APIs. Can it maybe like have a way to consume maybe JSON from a REST API, so batching it through very large data sets. So yeah, so you're saying importing through the API. Yeah, yes. You're going to run into those data limits, but it, like bringing stuff from a larger database, importing with JSON. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's important. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And what, what follow up question? What's the, what's the license? Um, it's Apache, I believe. You can look in our README or on our, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me the URL. Getgrist.com. Or you mean for this one? Yeah, getgrist.com is our, um, our website, yeah. I can also give out business cards. Mm -hmm. is, does it do any kind of versioning of the data? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one thing you can do, it's when you're working on a document that's already been published and people are working on it, you can work on a copy, which creates a fork that's unsaved. And then you can either choose to um, basically create backups of that to do some kind of versioning and then move people. So you can like version the one everyone's working on, make changes and then merge that. So you can do that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a lightweight version of versioning. Can you speak a little bit more about the standalone desktop version? That's something I run into a lot with CSOs and nonprofits, where there's real security concerns and tools like this, mm -hmm. where you have that option, super valuable. Can you speak some more about the sort of limitations of how it runs? Does it need a certain amount of like, horsepower, or is it just download as app seems to work fine in low user mm -hmm. settings? Yeah, download as an app works fine on any personal computer. It doesn't require a lot of resources. It doesn't sync yet. <laughs> That's on the roadmap. It's really just for personal use on your desktop. It doesn't like sync documents. Yeah. But you could work on something because it's very portable, export it, and then put it somewhere else or like, you know, as people do now with spreadsheets. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Is there any kind of audit log or, or 
or where you see what, you know, who has made what changes uh, when they use the interface? Yeah, so there is an activity log that shows who edited what. I want to make that better. <laughs> so like, technically it's there, and there's also, um, if you set it up on your self-hosted um, instance or on our SAS, it's already enabled. It also takes document history snapshots um, every few minutes, and then it gets kind of pruned over time, which is great, because you can go back to an old snapshot if somebody really messed something up and just restore. So that part's great. Um, but yeah, for the activity log, there is one. I basically want to make that a special table that's filterable, exportable, and just make that better without having it affect your um, data limits. Thank you so much.